Today we're going to get a little meta as we discuss the true magic of the Sorcerer in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Indeed, the Sorcerer's meta magic class feature is one of the most complex and nuanced abilities in the entire player's handbook, and we're going to talk about why. My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the, the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we discuss everything Dungeons & Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos every Thursday, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are going to take an in-depth look at the different options available to sorcerers when choosing their meta magic class feature, and how these relate to the different spells that you might choose for your character. And with only a few meta magic options that you get to pick throughout the course of playing a sorcerer, it's very important to pair them with the right spells so that you can get the most out of them. So let's get casting. So let's dive into the Font of Magic ability and Sorcery Points and how this whole thing works. Sorcery Points are the fuel behind the Sorcerer's Metamagic class feature. And there's a couple rules governing how you gain Sorcery Points and when you can spend them. First of all, your Sorcerer has a pool of Sorcery Points that you need to keep track of. These Sorcery Points are talked about in the Sorcerer table in the Player's Handbook. Pretty easy math though. The amount of sorcery points that you have is always equal to your sorcerer level. You can never have more sorcery points than this for your level. So if you're an 8th level sorcerer, you have 8 sorcery points. And if you are a 20th level sorcerer, you have 20. Sorcerers right away can convert their sorcery points into spell slots so that they can gain additional castings of any spells. They can create spells as high as 5th level, as long as they can cast spells of that level. A 1st level spell only costs 2 sorcery points. A 2nd level spell costs 3, but by the time you get up to a 5th level spell slot, that costs 7 sorcery points to create. Once created, it's yours to use however you see fit, but it does disappear if you don't use it by the time you take a long rest. On the other side of that, you can also give up spell slots to replenish spent sorcery points. This one's math is a little bit easier. It equals the spell slot that you're giving up. Whether you are creating spell slots or converting spells into sorcery points, this is always done as a bonus action on your turn. This actually gives the sorcerer a lot of power and control over their spell casting. With a more limited number of spells available to them than some of the other spellcasting classes, this sorcery points and meta magic option is really what allows them to really dictate how those spells are going to be used. So we're going to take a look at each of the meta magic options and what sort of spells might work best with them. Starting at third level, your sorcerer will be able to choose two from eight different meta magic abilities. These are all things that can be used to augment your spells as you cast them. When you get to 10th level and then again at 17th level, you get to pick another meta magic option, which means that even the highest level sorcerers only learn about half of the available meta magic choices. And for most of your character's career, you're only going to have two or three out of eight different options, which means that you really have to think about which meta magics you want to choose and make sure you're choosing ones that complement your spell choice. You can only use one meta magic per spell as you cast it, unless otherwise stated in the meta magic feature. The different meta magic options cost varying numbers of sorcery points, anywhere from one sorcery point up to three, or a variable value based on the level of the spell that you're applying the meta magic effect to. So let's dive in and take a look at the different meta magic options available to you and what spells you might want to use them with. So we're going to go through the meta magic options in alphabetical order. This is not a ranking system. We're just going to go one at a time and tell you our thoughts on them, starting with careful spell. When you cast a spell that forces creatures to make a saving throw, you can use careful spell for one sorcery point. And then a number of creatures equal to your Charisma modifier, automatically succeed on their saving throws against the spell. The big reason to take Careful Spell is that you get to protect your allies from the deadly effects of an area of effect spell if your party members are in that area. So if you're dropping a fireball on a bunch of enemies, but the fighter and the barbarian are also in their midst, you can use Careful Spell to allow the fighter and barbarian to automatically make their saving throws. However, 
Many spells like this still cause damage on a successful saving throw. So in this case, your fighter and barbarian are still going to take the half damage from your fireball. There are spells that do nothing when creatures make a successful saving throw. So for example, you could use careful spell on hypnotic pattern and prevent your fighter and barbarian from getting hypnotized by your own spell while you use that to pacify your enemies around them. There are some great uses for this metamagic when paired with spells that are either save or nothing. But if you're looking for that option that's going to stop your party from taking damage from all of your area of effect damage spells, this may not be the good choice that you think it is because there's going to be a lot of half damages still being tossed out to party members. Overall, I think that careful spell is not a replacement for good tactics and solid teamwork. The next meta magic feature that we're looking at is distance spell, where if you cast a spell that has a range of five feet or more, you can spend one sorcery point to double the distance. Also, if you are casting a spell that has a range of touch, its distance becomes 30 feet. Now, it's important to remember that distance spell is affecting the range of a spell, not its area. So if you're casting fireball, it increases the range of fireball to 300 feet, but doesn't change the radius of what the fireball's explosion is. So this does allow you to conduct battle at very, very long ranges. In fact, ranges that are so long, they don't often come up in play. I have heard somebody mention the idea of creating a multi-class warlock sorcerer with spell sniper and the invocation that allows you to double the distance of your Eldritch Blast and then combining all of those effects to have some ridiculous several it's thousand feet. It's over a thousand feet range yeah. on Eldritch Blast. And it sounds awesome. But at the same time, that's a lot of resources to put into just making your Eldritch Blast a thousand feet, which is going to come into play maybe once in your whole campaign where you have to shoot a dragon that's flying away or something. I don't know. I mean, that could be really, really useful. And I could see in a war-based campaign this being very useful where you are dealing with long ranges or perhaps your many sorcerer archetypes gain flight innately. And so maybe you're always going to be flying way overhead and you want to just rain down fireballs from an absurdly long range. Because there's a certain point with spells that you can actually have them exceed the range of a longbow. If you combine distant spell with spell sniper, it, it's pretty long, pretty quick. At the same time, the other benefit of distant spell is for touch spells. And I was going through the Player's Handbook, and I tried to find one in Player's Handbook or Xanathar's Guide of a touch spell that deals damage. And the only one that I could find on the Sorcerer's Spell list was Shocking Grasp. Which, it's it's a decent spell, but I mean, that's a very limited mm -hmm. option. Uh, it does work very well if you're playing a Divine Soul Sorcerer. Yes, because Divine Soul Sorcerers get a few more touch-based spells. Because you can use Distant Spell to deliver buffs as well. There's many great buff spells like Fly and Invisibility, or in the case of Divine Soul Sorcerers, Cure Wounds, that have a range of touch. So being able to use Distance Spell to deliver those spells to your allies at range could be pretty handy. So if you are kind of playing that buffer type character that wants to be able to use these spells at a little bit more of a distance, pretty good. Although you might be tempted by some other metamagic options instead. The next metamagic feature we're going to talk about is Empowered Spell. This means that when you roll damage for a spell, you can spend one sorcery point to re-roll a number of damage dice equal to your charisma modifier. You must use the new rolls, and you can use this metamagic as well as another one. Empowered Spell might be one of the strongest options for metamagic, particularly for a damage-dealing character. It lets you take those really disappointing ones and twos that you roll when you're casting Fireball and potentially turn them into fives and sixes, gaining a lot of extra damage points, especially for area of effect damage spells like Fireball and Cone of Cold, which have one damage roll that's applied to a bunch of enemies. One thing that I've learned is that this actually doesn't work too well with some of the lower end damage dealing spells. It's kind of a toss up on whether you want to spend one sorcery point to reroll 1d6 on your Scorching Ray, 
where I think it's better suited for those big area of effect spells that involve rolling multiple dice, where you can actually benefit from saying, I'm going to use a sorcery point to re-roll four or five dice. However, one of the fantastic things about Empowered Spell is that you don't have to choose to use it until you've already rolled the dice. And you get to choose which of the dice you want to re-roll. You can basically count on being able to empower every meaningful damage dealing spell that you care to cast, which is great. The one sorcery point combined with the fact that you can use this on top of other meta magics on the same spell makes this probably one of the go-to pickups if you are going to be uh, packing your sorcerer with some damage dealing spells. This should be one of your early picks. The next meta magic we're looking at is extended spell. If you cast a spell that has a duration of one minute or longer, you can use one sorcery points to double the duration of that spell, up to a maximum of 24 hours. So because of this really fine restriction, it prevents you from doing a bunch of tricksy things, like having a spell with a duration of 24 hours now last two days, or those really small spells like shield extending them to last two rounds. Can't do it with this. What you can do it for are many battlefield control effects or buff spells that last one minute or longer. I generally find that very few combat encounters last more than 10 rounds or one minute. So I'm probably not inclined to use this on a spell that would only have a duration of one minute anyways, because I likely don't need it for longer than a minute. And in a pretty aggressive battle, the likelihood that your concentration won't be broken at some point is pretty low. I think the main reason for this meta magic feature is to be used by those strategic magicians who are throwing out spells outside of combat that have a duration of one hour and they'd like it to last longer. Or even things like if I'm enlarging or reducing something with the goal to carry it from point A to point B, moving one minute to two minutes can be a bit of a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be the the one thing that you need in order to perform the task that you're setting out to do. But once again, those might be pretty niche circumstances. I could absolutely see this being worthwhile to use on a long lasting buff spell, such as invisibility or fly or polymorph, or a spell like disguise self, perhaps even an illusion that you're putting into place. All of these spells benefit from an increased duration if you need to have a strategic reason for it to be in place. Ultimately, what that does, though, is it's saving you the spell slot and saving you from having to cast the spell twice. That can be valuable, especially considering it's only one sorcery point. I think that you need to have a fair number of spells that last an hour or more that you're going to use in a strategic way to really get the most of extended spell i honestly as soon as you say disguise self that seems like the most useful one for this is if mm -hmm. you are playing a, a sorcerer who is a infiltrator and like a master of disguise uh this could be a really good pickup for them because then you can spend a few hours in your disguise yeah once again the divine souls really rock this one because there's a really good selection of concentration free buff spells that clerics gain access to that are not on the regular sorcerer list. And so being able to double the duration of say, protection from poison or death ward or freedom of movement are all pretty valuable. And I can see using it in those ways because those are all spells that you wanna have up and running for quite a long time, but you don't necessarily know when in its duration it might come up. The next meta magic we're looking at is heightened spell. When you cast a spell that causes an enemy to make a saving throw, you can spend three sorcery points to give them disadvantage on that saving throw. Now, Heightened Spell is one of the rarest and most reliable ways to impose disadvantage on saving throws against one of your spells. But it only applies to a single creature affected by a spell casting. So if you're casting a spell like Hypnotic Pattern that affects a group of creatures, those three sorcery points are spent to only impose disadvantage to the saving throws made by one of those creatures. And it's only the first saving throw that creature makes against the spell. So if you use it for hold person, for instance, just the first saving throw applies to it. With heightened spell, 
and all of these restrictions, I will say that at the cost of three sorcery points, it is a bit of a gamble to use. It can be really, really potent, or it can be a big waste of resources. Imposing disadvantage on a creature's saving throw is like giving it a minus five penalty to the saving throw. Although, certain types of creatures, you're still only breaking even. This doesn't help you against the legendary monster's legendary resistance. They automatically make their saving throw. It also only helps you break even against a creature that has magic resistance or has gotten advantage on a saving throw from another source. And even then, you run the risk that the creature could still make their save because they just have a really impressive saving throw bonus against the effect that you want to apply to them. And so the disadvantage isn't really that impactful to them. I've also seen disadvantage rolls where both rolls still end up in like the high teens or 20s. Yep. And that's something that can commonly happen. And once again, when you're a low level sorcerer, three sorcery points could be all or half, or it's going to be a large chunk of your sorcery points for a maybe. Yeah, and that makes it a bit of a gamble because you have to choose to spend the sorcery points before the roll is made. If heightened spell worked like empowered spell and you got to force a creature who succeeded a saving throw to re-roll, it would be much, much better because then you'd only use it when it was worthwhile. In those cases where I've got a spell like mental prison or hold person or hold monster or hypnotic pattern, these types of spells that can take a monster out of the fight entirely if they fail their saving throw, well, that might be a gamble that's worth taking. So if you're going to load up on those types of spells, this still could be pretty worthwhile for you. It's just that it's always going to be a bit of a gamble, particularly because it's only one creature that gets affected by it. Let's talk about Quicken Spell. If you cast a spell that has a casting time of one action, you can use two sorcery points to switch it to a bonus action instead. Quicken Spell is one of the most popular and well-loved meta magic options for a very good reason. Casting spells as a bonus action is awesome. However, you need to remember the rule on casting spells as a bonus action because Quicken Spell does not override that. A lot of people make the misconception with Quicken Spell that this will allow you to cast two spells on your turn. One is your action and one is your bonus action. But by the rules for spell casting, if you cast a spell with a casting time of one bonus action, you cannot cast another spell on your turn unless it is a cantrip with a cast time of one action. This means that casting a spell as a bonus action prevents you from casting spells with your reaction or action during the same turn. After you've quickened a spell, you can still use your action to throw one of your damage dealing cantrips, but that's it. And in my books, two sorcery points for the extra damage from a cantrip is not always worth it except in a really desperate situation where you need the damage. I've actually used Quicken Spell a few times for this and every time I've been a little bit disappointed when I realized that I just used two sorcery points to do maybe five or six more damage to an enemy and it doesn't really seem worth it. When this does become really useful is when you have a spell in effect that allows you to use your action to continue doing something on your turn with that spell, and now you can quicken other spells. A few spells that are great for this are Watery Sphere, Eye Bite, and Sunbeam. These are all concentration-based spells that you can cast as an action, but that grant you a new thing that you can do with your action on subsequent turns, but you can already use the effect right away. If you quicken Sunbeam, not only do you get to launch that ray of blinding, brilliant light as the bonus action that you use to cast the spell, but now you can immediately use your action to throw a second Sunbeam. And then on subsequent turns, you can use your action to throw that Sunbeam forward and then quicken the other leveled spells that you want to use. Because spells like Sunbeam, Eye Bite, and Watery Sphere, and many of these other spells with action granted effects come online pretty late, I think Quicken Spell is a really good option for your 10th level metamagic. 
looking at it, there are so many uses and good uses for quick and spell that make it one of the best options for meta magics. But you need to make sure that you have spells that can really play into the ability to move spell casting from action to bonus action. Yeah, I will say in desperate circumstances, quickening a spell and then throwing a cantrip out is a great way to rack up some extra damage. It's pretty good as well if you have Eldritch Blast, either from the Magic Initiate feat or because you multiclassed with Warlock, because Eldritch Blast is a really good cantrip that's totally worth casting. A few people asked us, if I cast a spell as my action, is it a problem if I let the sorcerer then quicken a cantrip? And on paper, it doesn't seem like it. But here's the reason why it's important that the leveled spell is always the quickened one and the cantrip is the one that you cast with the action. You can't apply two meta magic effects to the same spell. So if you allow a player to quicken a cantrip and then use their action to cast a spell, they can now apply a meta magic to that spell, which they wouldn't be able to do when you follow the rules normally. The only other use that I can think of for quicken spell that's popped into my head is when it comes to my turn and I want to do both something that deals damage and something tactical like a mage hand or a minor illusion or something of that sort that could yeah. change the battlefield. Well, and that, that's also like where you need to interact with something like maybe there's something else that you need to do with your action. Like, for instance, you have to dig through your bag of holding to grab something, but you still want to be able to throw a spell. Or I think another really good example of this might be you want to use Dimension Door to escape, but you need to dash to get to an ally to get to them. So there are a bunch of circumstances where you want to use one of those other action types, like dash, dodge, or disengage, or you want to interact with the environment in some way, but then you still want to throw that spell out. So that's where Quick and Spell becomes really, really valuable. I think Quick and Spell is a must-have. At some point. At some point. I think that if you're not going to take it right away, I think you definitely want to make it your 10th level pick. I wouldn't wait till 17th level to take it. It's 100% one of the ones that you want to have. It's just too useful. But just don't overuse the whole Quick in the Fireball, throw the Firebolt. It's a good way to Nova your damage, but you're going to burn through your spell slots and sorcery points really, really quickly doing that. And now we come to Subtle Spell. You can use a sorcery point to remove the verbal and somatic components from your spell casting for one spell. S subtle Spell enables an entire new playstyle, the Stealth Mage, which is really cool. And considering that Subtle Spell is only one sorcery point, meaning that it can be applied to the vast majority of your spell casts, you can enable some really cool plays with it. If you want to build your stealth mage who's good at dealing damage, your early picks being empowered spell and subtle spell with only one sorcery point each and both being able to be used on the same spell, you can build a pretty cool character that can actually dish out meta magic onto most of the spells they cast. The Sorcerer is a charisma-based spellcaster, which means that it's very easy for a Sorcerer to be the face of the party and engage in role-playing and social situations. And you may often be tempted to use tricky spells like Suggestion or Detect Thoughts or Illusion Magic to gain the upper hand in your social interactions. The problem with doing this is that many of these spells have verbal and somatic components, which betray the fact that you are casting a spell. And me personally, as a DM, I'm very strict about my verbal and somatic components. It's hard in, for spellcasters in my campaign to conceal that they're casting spells, which is why Subtle Spell is so valuable. Uh, I, I did not take Subtle Spell with my Sorcerer, and the amount of times that I wish I had has been astronomical, because my mm -hmm. entire character is based on casting spells during social situations. That's actually why I originally took Suggestion and why I actually ended up dropping Suggestion yeah. because I couldn't get it to go off without everybody being like, did you just cast Suggestion on that guy? And me being like, y yeah, it didn't work, sorry. Uh, if I had had Subtle Spell, it would have gone over way smoother. And I think that this is actually a really important thing. On paper, when I read Subtle Spell, I said, oh, that's not very useful. But now that I'm playing a sorcerer, 
it can be one of the most useful options. It has so many applications in both a stealth and exploration circumstances, as well as in social situations, and even can be useful in combat if you want to cast greater invisibility on yourself and then subtly cast all your fireballs so that nobody knows where you actually are. Although I will say that with projectile-based spells that have a visible kind of pew-pew laser beam, that does still kind of give away your position, even though you're not moving or saying anything when you cast it. A subtly cast spell can be so imperceptible that another spellcaster can't see it to counterspell it. I don't know if subtle spell is a must-have, but if you are planning to play your sorcerer as the face of the party in a campaign that isn't just going to be a battle-heavy dungeon crawl, if you're going to have a lot of mm -hmm. social interactions, a lot of uh, political intrigue and things like that, where casting spells amidst an interaction is important, then I think Subtle Spell could be one of the most valuable meta magics and one of the most valuable abilities yeah. for a spellcaster in the entire game. Yeah. It, but in the right campaign. Yeah, I think it really enables a playstyle which is rare. Uh, and a playstyle that is really effective as well. And so I think that if you are building your character with the intention to use Subtle Spell and make good use of it, you'll have a lot of fun playing that character. The last meta magic we're going to be looking at today is Twin Spell. If you cast a spell that targets one creature and doesn't have a range of self, you can spend a number of sorcery points equal to the spell's level to have it hit a second target as well. Now, there was a small errata added for Twin Spell that you might not see in your early printings of the Player's Handbook, and it clarifies that in order to be eligible, Twin Spell must be incapable of targeting more than one creature at the spell's current level. This means that spells such as Ray of Frost and Chromatic Orb are eligible to be used with Twin Spell, but spells like Magic Missile and Scorching Ray, which can target one creature but can also be split up amongst multiple, are not eligible for Twin Spell whatsoever. Twin Spell can only be used on spells which target creatures and not areas. So Twin Spell cannot be used with spells such as Fireball or Cone of Cold, or spells which create objects or summon creatures, or don't explicitly target a creature in the spell description. A Twin Spell targets an additional creature. This is not the same as casting the spell twice which actually means that if you are casting a concentration spell that targets a single creature, you can use Twin Spell to double the amount of creatures that you are concentrating that spell on. This makes Twin Spell especially awesome for powerful buff spells like Enhance Ability, Enlarge Reduce, Greater Invisibility, Haste, and Polymorph, all of which are spells that normally only target a single creature and require your concentration but now get a doubled effect from being twinned. This is one of the only ways to enhance a concentration spell to have more things going on with your concentration than would normally be allowed, which is really incredible. And in my opinion, the best use of twin spell, far and above better than twinning damage dealing spells, I would much rather twin things like haste or polymorph mm -hmm. than a damage dealing spell. Also, watch out for spells that allow you to target yourself, but then apply to other creatures. For example, you can't twin Eye Bite because that spell targets yourself, even though you're then using Eye Bite to target other creatures. I agree with Kelly. I think that twinning a damage dealing spell sounds awesome on paper, but is a little bit of a gamble, similar to Heightened Spell. Twinning a Disintegrate sounds amazing unless both the creatures make their save and throw, and now not only have you wasted six sorcery points, but you've also wasted your sixth level spell slot, which really hurts. That's a lot of resources, and if they save and nothing happens, you're going to be pretty devastated. This is actually why I think things like Haste and Polymorph, where you uh, target, for me, polymorphing your teammates mm -hmm. into giant apes or T-Rexes or whatever you want to polymorph them into, and being able to sit back and be like, both my party members are now giant monsters that are going to kick your butt. That's a much better use because there's no saves involved. Yeah. You're just choosing two people. Same with haste. Hasting both of your frontline party members 
so that they get more attacks, more speed, more options, is a really good use of Twin Spell and actually super, super powerful. The only disappointing thing with this is that Twin Haste and Twin Polymorph are so good, your party might never let you do anything else with your concentration ever again, especially if you have a Battlemaster Fighter and a Gloomstalker Ranger in your party, you're probably going to be stuck with hasting them for the rest of your adventuring career, which fortunately is really, really good, but it does mean that if you do choose to have haste and polymorph and greater invisibility and twin spell, you probably might not want to load up on too many other concentration-based spells because they're so good doing this that it might just be your go-to strategy 95% of the time. A lot of spells that you might be considering using Twin Spell for can actually be twinned just by upcasting them. Things like Hold Monster, Invisibility, Fly, Banishment, Hold Person. These are spells that when you upcast them, actually allow you to choose an additional target. So really, using Twin Spell on these isn't as good of an option as just upcasting them. Although you do get the lower level spell slot cost for that, which is cheaper than buying the spell slot with metamagic. Your mileage may vary. In general, with the way that sorcerers gain sorcery points, you can usually twin both of your highest level spells, and that's all you're ever going to do with your sorcery points. So thinking about how often you're going to be able to twin spells is pretty valuable because it's not something that... If you're going through a lot of combat encounters, you're not going to be using it on the vast majority of your spells. So you really want to save it for those ones that make a big impact. So in review, looking at all the metamagic options, all the different spells that we can actually combine with them, looking at what's on the sorcerer spell list, what do you think are your recommendations and best practices, Kelly? In my opinion, I think that it's best to load up on some of the lower cost metamagics early on and save some of the bigger cost ones for later. You're not going to have that many sorcery points early on in the game. So when mm -hmm. I look at empowered spell and subtle spell, those are two great pickups for early on. Yeah. If you wanted to, you could grab quicken either early because it is only a cost of two sorcery points. And if you don't grab it early on, you would probably want to grab it at 10th anyway. For something like Twin Spell, which I think does make it pretty high on my list of good meta magics, that is one that I think is geared more towards your 10th level spot. Because picking it early on, not only are you not going to have that many options for spells to use with Twin Spell effectively, but also it is the highest cost one. I know that at low levels, you'll only be using it on low level spells, but still mm. the economy of using those, those sorcery points best means that you want to take things that are one or two points only. If you pick up Twin Spell and you're going to Twin Haste, what else are you going to do with your sorcery points now? Well, you're probably going to throw a bunch of damage dealing spells and fireballs and stuff like that. So that's where Empowered Spell is probably a val valuable combo with that. My, my four picks are, are probably Subtle, Empower, Twin, and Quicken. This is the hard But I kind of want them all early. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that basically what, what's going to happen is you're going to want subtle because you're going to want twin and quicken it's going to be the question of do you want subtle spell or do you want empowered spell and that's really the tough choice and i i do think that there is this weird thing with the meta magic options where so many fall by the wayside because mm -hmm. of how good those four options are yeah it's almost as if when i look at the page i read the other options and i can't imagine playing a sorcerer that doesn't take empowered subtle quicken and twin yeah, as my yeah. four options you only get to choose four out of the total of eight and you only get a limited number of sorcery points that you can use per long rest so you want to make them count as you level up it's worth thinking about what percentage of your spells you can actually augment with your meta magic things like subtle and empowered spell because they only cost one sorcery point can be used with the vast majority of your spells Whereas Twin Spell is probably something you're going to keep in reserve for only your most impactful spells. So thinking about what that is going to be is worth it. So this has been a look at the Sorcerer's Metamagic ability in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Tell us about your favorite metamagic picks in the comments below. 
If you're enjoying the show, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. You can find out how by following the links in the description below. And if you want to see me struggle through trying to use my sorcery points on Meta Magic, you can check out our live play Dungeons of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And of course, we've got a great series where we're looking in depth at the various spells in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.